Thank you, Taffy, and thanks for having me back in ARE. Um, so yeah, today I wanted to talk to you about some of the research I've been doing in the last three years since my PhD, um, which has kind of continued on my PhD work, which I did in this, in this school. Um, but we've been trying to kind of push some boundaries and try and develop it to inform practical decisions in marine park planning. And yes, I've roped Nicole and Charlie in to help me. So before I jump in, just a quick review on Australia and our current levels of protection in things like no cape marine reserves. So this is a map of all of the protected areas in Australia. It's quite a bit, there's different colours, different zones. In those different zones, different activities are allowed. And probably the key conservation areas are the green bits, which are the no tape marine reserves. So those are areas where there's no extractive activities allowed, um, but people are allowed to go visit those areas generally. Um, and there's kind of this division to between coastal waters within three nautical miles, which is managed by the state government, and then the offshore Commonwealth managed waters, which are more than three nautical miles from the coast. So, you know, the offshore waters are managed centrally by the federal government and the state government managing those coastal strips. If you add up all the different protected areas, 47% of Australia's EEZ is in some form of quote unquote marine protected area, although different levels of access are allowed in some of those areas. A lot of those allow fishing, for example, um, which you might not think of as a marine protected area necessarily. 11% of Australia's EEZ is in no take, so that's not, not extractive. Um, and whilst that is pretty high in global standards in terms of levels of no take, a lot of those areas are placed a long way from people, as I'll talk a bit more about, um, in kind of residual locations where they're not impacting activities very much. Uh, and the process of developing no take marine reserves is highly politicised. So you know, you know, just kind of flick a switch and turn these things on. There's a big process around that. And one thing I've been observing. Uh, increasingly is that there's often little or flawed uh, integration of social and economic information into the decision making process. So I'll talk a bit more about what I mean by that, but broadly it's kind of biological principles that are informing the design of these things as there should be, but there sh should also be this layer of social and economic data integration. Um, as well as that big picture, more recently in Western Australia there's kind of some small scale things going on. This is a map of Mindari Marine Park, which is off the north beaches of Perth. Um, and the blue area is the actual marine park and the little tiny green bits. Those are the no-take marine reserves, those are the bits you can't go fishing in. Uh, some records for the smallest no-take marine reserves in the country there. But there are plans to increase the marine park scope to go up to uh, kind of north of two rocks and things. Okay, I don't think that's all. Anyway. Maybe I need to risk out of that map um, <laughs> to go north. And then within there, there'll be sanctuary zones being zoned. And that kind of, it's a process that's underway at the moment. And then on the south coast, there's the proposal for a new south coast marine park, um, which will stretch somewhere from roughly Bremen Bay. Well, it won't necessarily, but the planning area is from Bremen Bay to the South Australian border. Within that, they'll select an area that will be zoned as marine park. And within those, there'll be things like no tape marine reserves. Okay, so it's kind of, um, there's a lot going on here at the moment, particularly. Uh, a lot of decisions being made, both of these processes are underway right now and kind of in parallel. And before I kind of go into our whole research theme, I kind of got tuned by this from talking to Ben the other day in our class and we you know what, what are we working towards as an end game? And I think maybe subconsciously what I'm working towards is Marine reserves being informed by a transparent discussion and potentially estimation of the costs and benefits of these areas. And I know I'm preaching to the choir, but not everyone necessarily thinks that that's a good idea in this space. Um, and yes, estimation is really difficult because it's really complex systems, spatially linked, and things like that. So, the outline of the talk today is going to be five sections. I'm going to be talking about what are marine reserves for, um, and then I will talk about rapid spatial data collection. I'll then hand over to Nicole, who's going to present on some marine recreational and utility models at a decision scale. Um, and then Charlotte's going to be talking about integration of those with biology and particularly fish biology. And then I'll talk about next steps. So what are marine reserves for again? 
And the common answer to this is biodiversity conservation. And I was thinking about this the other day, and I remember our first PhD meeting with the Tafferty and Marit and Tim, my other supervisor, and I think Marit asked Tim, like, why are these things a good idea? Why, why should we have marine reserves? And Tim's answer was, because they're a good idea. <laughs> and, um, <laughs> and Marit was not very satisfied with that answer. And I don't think I would be. And so there's a lack of language around how to talk about these benefits, I feel. And we're not talking about them clearly. We talk about great things like biodiversity conservation without necessarily understanding what that means or conservation of what and how. Um, and the way that marine reserves are currently being implemented is around these biological principles of CAR, which is comprehensive, adequate, and representative, which means that we go out there and we look at different habitats and we try and protect representative areas of those different habitats in sanctuary zones of sufficient size and replicated across the landscape. Um, and then we do that, but we also try and minimize impacts on extractive activities. So we're kind of like, doing cost efficiency analysis. How do we represent different habitats whilst minimizing overlap with things like fish? Um, and this also doesn't quite seem right with me because the areas where people go fishing are potentially areas that are under pressure. They're also areas that are potentially valuable for non-fishing activities like diving or snorkeling or general enjoyment. There's some correlation there. Um, and the current strategy of implementing these things just doesn't allow for putting reserves in areas that are of high use but potentially going to create uh, fantastic like tourism opportunities, for example. So we tend to put reserves in residual locations. i just said this again. So uh, <laughs> reserves tend to be positioned in residual locations. And this is a map of some of the Australian reef parts of Perth. Um, and there's a couple of examples that come to mind, like this little green bit, you see that there? You know, it's kind of positioned in the back corner of that marine park. And, you know, surveys up there and asked fishermen what they thought about these sanctuary zones. And a lot of them were like, oh, what, why is that area? Why, what's that about? And it's because they notice that that's just what well, they think that's a sandy patch, basically. And that there's no structure there. They're not quite sure why that's being justified or that why they should give up that sandy patch. As far as they're concerned, not many people fish there. Um, so it raises questions for fishermen as well. So fishers might challenge areas like that, which are designed to meet a percentage area target by habitat, but they want you to be able to point to a particular reserve and go, what's that for? And what's that one for? And what's that one for? And that's not something that we can do at the moment because we're going for these percentage areas by habitat under these biological principles. Um, and all of this is to say that observing conversations in this space it seems that people are talking past each other a little bit. Like the fishermen expect you to be able to point at a particular location to say what a reserve is for, and the biologists come across and say, reserves across habitats are a good idea. And we kind of vaguely agree on that, but we don't really tackle the, uh, the trade-offs and the kind of the nitty-gritty of how these two things interact. Another example is Redfish West, with peak body group for recreational fishing in Western Australia. And they've put out a position statement on marine parks that says basically that if they're going to lose access, we need to prove that fishing activities pose an unacceptable risk to that location um, and that we should avoid basically creating sanctuary zones where possible. Which, you know, they support them, but there's these conditions on it. And again, this is kind of speaking to that point to that reserve and telling me why that's there and why you can justify closing me out of that area. And overall, oh, sorry, is that a little thing? That. Overall, I think we can do a little bit better bit than this with the language that we use when we talk about the benefits. And so there's a quick warning for this kind of untested ideas ahead. So this is some ideas that I'm formulating at the moment, trying to develop into a paper. So I'd love your feedback on it. But the idea is that there isn't one type of room reserve and not one objective. There's potentially, I've identified five. Okay, and the first one is as insurance. So this kind of gets implicitly what the biologists are getting at, is that there is a dominance of unknown unknowns in the marine environment. The way that we interact and have impact on marine ecosystems is really complicated. We are okay at single species management fisheries. We're actually quite good at it. 
but the ecosystem impacts, we don't necessarily understand the impacts on endangered species, for example, impacts on habitats. A lot of those are going unseen. Um, and the idea is that if you have marine reserves, they can act as insurance and de-risk that environment, make it more stable. Um, and how would you implement this type of reserve? You would have comprehensive adequate representative, which are the principles that they came up with. You don't know where the risks are. You don't know where the pressures are. You represent each habitat in sufficient size. You're going to have some kind of insurance policy against you know, whatever the nature of that impact might be. But then it, the question is, how do you actually measure success of that? And my current thinking is it might be impossible, right? You're, you're trying to manage the unknown, basically. Um, but if you have any ideas, feel free to share them. Uh, the next reason you might want to create a marine reserve is to reduce a known spatial threat. So sometimes fishing is known in a particular location to have detrimental impacts on things like you know, an important area for endangered species, for example. You can isolate that area and you can say, okay, if we're close fishing to that area, we expect that endangered species to recover or at least halt in its decline. That's kind of more targeted than this insurance one. And I kind of implicitly think that's what Redfish West are thinking of when they say, point to that reserve and tell me why it's there. Um, obviously, this is much more straightforward to explain to people. You close areas where, where fishing is impacting pe things people value, like endangered species, and you would measure success by improved or halted decline of those endangered species. The third reason is scientific discovery. So reserves act as controls for the effects of fishing. How else do you know the impact that fishing is going to have unless you have an area where there is no fishing, for example? Fish behaviour, fish ecology, all changes with and without fishing, but it's not something you can study unless you have areas that don't have fishing. Um, and a pretty prudent approach to optimising for that is to have, again, comprehensive, adequate and representative. You have a natural experiment where you have all the different habitats represented with areas with and without fishing. And that allows you to draw the contrast out. Uh, and you can measure success of that. You can have discoveries that utilise the reserve design. Right? Again, this is not something that people talk about very much, um, but it's a potential benefit. Uh, number four is human connection or enjoyment. And for this, I'll use a little anecdote of New Zealand's first marine reserve at Lee. Um, and this is a picture of Lee, and it's basically in a bay, a little island, and they create a reserve there actually for scientific purposes. There's a little marine lab on the, on the bay there. But the New Zealand Herald, when this reserve was being created, wrote there's nothing to do with Coat Island anymore, which is the island in and the idea was that people were going there, going spear fishing, quick fishing, and that was the primary activity, but you were going to exclude that, so no one would ever go there anymore. That's basically a waste of time. But then a couple of years later, the place is packed full of tourists, people ready to dive, people going on school groups, visiting this area. The snapper really got uh, stuck populations really recovered in that little bay. They came really close to shore, potentially changed behaviour, interacting with people in interesting ways. And just created a great opportunity for, you know, if you lived in New Zealand and you want to learn how to dive, why not go to this sheltered bay where it's really calm, you can see big fish while you're doing it. If you want to learn about marine ecosystems, why not go there with a school group? So I've created all these opportunities for human connection. Um, how do you implement these? You need to potentially, you want to actually put these reserves close to access points and human population centres. You don't want them being super remote where no one can get to them. Marmion and Marine Park or Perth is perhaps a good opportunity to create this type of reserve. Have a big population that can access that place. Um, and you can measure that success. And so increased visitation, visitor experiences, and potentially if through this interaction there might be an increase in pro-environmental behaviours or changes in attitudes. The fifth objective is fisheries benefits. So in some limited cases, reserves can actually enhance fisheries. Uh, yields and maybe economic returns. Okay, it's not a foregone conclusion because it's quite complicated, but particularly where there's source sink dynamics, so there's an area of the fishery that's important for larvae and they're feeding the rest of the fishery, closing that source is often a good idea because it will actually increase yields. 
There's other situations. If it's difficult to manage the fishery, if there's a lot of fishermen in small scale boats that you can't monitor and things like that, marine reserves are potentially an okay solution. Um, and there's just sort of certain corner solutions where marine reserves might actually benefit fishing. I think we need to be a little bit careful about saying that all reserves will benefit fishing, but there are certain cases. Um, and it's easy to implement them and then measure their success. So do you see improvement in yield or economic returns? Okay, so those are kind of my five thoughts on why we might have marine reserves. And I think doing this kind of exercise is potentially useful because it provides a language to then talk about the benefits and the costs. Um, it breaks down biodiversity conservation into very specific categories and it stops people talking past each other. Um, these things are not mutually exclusive. I can imagine marine parks that would have areas for insurance, which probably look very much like scientific discovery optimization, but then also have a few areas for human connection. Right? Have a couple of reserves close to people where people can go diving and snorkeling to see the fish and things like that. Um, again, thoughts are welcome on this kind of breakdown. I'm kind of just workshopping it. Workshopped it with these guys before, and I'll see what you guys think. Um, <clears throat> and it might provide a bit of a basis for things like choice experiments, for example. So you can trade off these different attributes and see what people's preferences are for the outcomes of these things. Cool. So that's what I had on what the marine reserves for. The next section is some work we've been doing to inform Marmion and South Coast Marine Parks. Um, we'll talk a bit more about them. So these marine park planning processes have been underway this year, basically quite rapid things. And there was just an initial lack of data on where do people go and what do they do? So while fisheries are out there monitoring how much fishing is going on, they're not monitoring it at a scale that's appropriate for marine park planning. And there's no other necessary spatial data about where people are going out in the water here. So we've been working with DBCA, who um, you know, state government in charge of creating these marine parks, and the WRF Rangers, so Et and TAC is the group. Um, we've been working with them down in Esperance to design survey tools that allow us to map where people are going and what they're doing out the water. And we've developed this thing called the Marine Values Mapper, which is a R shiny web app um, and full credit. Mr. Brooke Gibbons here, who has created the web app. Um, and it has two sides. It goes, has a public facing survey side where you can distribute it face to face or online. People can click through what they want to map and then click on areas that they want to map. And then that links to a database which has an admin view which allows you to interrogate the data. And I'll show you a bit more what I mean by that. Um, uh, are we going to play? Yeah, cool. So this is a screenshot of the app. Got a few instructions. You first pick what activities you'd like to map. There's actually activities, also areas of conservation significance, and area you can map pressures as well. Um, and then for this example, we'll just map demersal fishing, and you click next, and it generates a couple of questions about the nature of your fishing or that particular activity that you've selected, and it gives you this little interactive map that you can scroll through and click on the polygons of areas that are important for that particular activity. So it allows you to map quite rapidly, um, you know, how you use the environment and what you see there. And then it's got this other admin view, which DDCA can see and can be used for planning, where you can filter by different activities and see heat maps. That was really quick. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but the idea is that in a relatively rapid period of time, we've been able to create these heat maps of different activities, understand how people are using the area, understand which areas are important for conservation, which areas are having pressures and things like that. Um, the values mapper is being used to inform the South Coast Mummy and Marine Park designs. That's part of the discussive process at the moment. And it's led to a string of projects um, because basically people like maps which maybe is an experience that everyone has had. But Brooke has spent a lot of time since then making more web apps and more maps. Um, cool. So I'll now hand over to Nicole to talk about green recreational grand utility models. 
Okay, can everyone hear me? Yeah. Um, okay, hi everyone. So I'm Nicole. I'm Matt's PhD student. Um, today I'm just going to tell you a little bit about my project, which has been developing marine recreational random utility models to try and inform marine management. So going back to the mapper, so me and my colleague Elle went down to the south coast and we distributed the marine values mapper along the south coast. But we also distributed another survey called the community use survey. And so if you were to ask me to summarize the values mapper in a sentence, I would say it's a face-to-face -face, map based survey on marine recreational activities to inform the proposed south coast marine plan. If you ask me what the community use survey is for, I would say exactly the same thing. <laughs> so how are the two surveys different? Why do we spend so much time doing two surveys and collecting information that in a sentence seems like it would be very similar? Um, so I'm just going to run you through what the community use survey, um, what sort of data we collect for it, and then I'll highlight the differences afterwards. So um, I'm going to use the example, we've done this work also in Exmouth, so I'm going to use an example for Exmouth. So if we are at a boat ramp, say Santa Pity um, in Exmouth, we can ask them what they did that day. And we can ask them very trip specific information. So they might say, we went out the back of the reef and we went to Mercer fishing. So that's the first activity they did. I can then get trip specific information about what time they got there, what time they left. I can get catch specific information. I can also get a very accurate spatial point. It's a point rather than a polygon. Um, so I can get as accurate as you can by talking to people. Sometimes they'll have a look at the map and they'll put it exactly where they went. Uh, but with the community survey, we can ask, you know, what did you do next? And maybe they went trawling along the back of the reef. And then maybe they came back in and went for a snorkel on the inside of the reef. And then we can get information about what times they've done them, how long they spent on each activity. Um, and so it's a lot more fine scale, spatially and in terms of the trip specifics. And we can do this for not just one trip, but we can do it for multiple trips as well. So if they're up for a really good chat and they're quite happy to keep talking, I can then say, what did you do yesterday? And maybe they went surfing, maybe they went to the beach and then the wind dropped so they went fishing somewhere on the boat. So it's a lot more fine scale in terms of the trip information we get. And so the mapper is a bit more broader scope spatial scale, the community survey is more um, accurate spatially um, and then the community survey has all the, uh, the trip data which is a lot more useful and I realise I made a spell on the last slide because the biggest difference is that with the marine values mapper we can't make a wrong and with the community survey we can. <laughs> <laughs> So we can make a run with the community survey with the data we collect. And so um, the raw data looks like this when we do the community survey. It's, you know, we get a map, we can look at extractive and non-extractive data of people's uses, um, and each point is a spatial location, someone's done an activity. Um, this is already pretty useful. We can already get a lot more fine-scale spatial data. Like Matt said, most human use data is pretty broad. It doesn't really tell us where people are going, but we can kind of see where the use patterns are, where people are clustering. Um, but the more useful part is using it in random utility models. So it's probably some economists in here that can tell me more about RUMS than I can, but um, for context of what I'm doing, I'll go over them quickly. Um, so a random utility model is an economics reveals preference model, which allows us to infer what people's preferences are by looking at what, what site they're choosing for their recreation. And this is a function of the attributes of all the available sites they could have gone to. Um, and so let's say John is a fisherman and he can go to site A, which is sheltered, it's really far away from the boat ramp, but he's going to catch two fish. He also goes to site B, which is also sheltered, but it's much closer to the boat ramp, but he's only going to catch one fish. So we know that if John chooses site B, that he places more value on going to a site that's closer to the boat ramp than catching the one extra fish you would catch at site A. Um, and so using this, we know what John's preferences are, and we can figure out how changes in the individual attributes or the availability of sites completely will impact John's recreation and where he will go instead. And so this is what we've been doing is running these simulations with these random utility models. And so we're in the middle of developing a flexible management tool that we can use to test different simulations. We can use it to hopefully we can do spatial simulations at the moment, but we're also going to do it in temporal closures and bag limits. Um, and we're currently in the process of developing it into another web app. We like web apps in our lab. Um, so we made this yesterday, so I'm going to give you an example of how we're hope, well, example of what it's like to snow, but it will be um, changed. Uh, so and I'll talk about the context of this in a minute when it loads to the next page, because it might take a minute. Um, so for the South Coast region, for example, you can zoom in on an area. So let's say we want to be in Esperance. 
And then you can simulate a no-take zone. So we could say, for a spatial simulation, we could say, okay, let's close off um, Cull Island and Woody Island. And then you can start your simulation. So the code in the background will run the run in the simulation. Um, and it will provide us with some outputs. <laughs> is it going to work? Yes, it's going to work. So all this will give you the context. The reason we're developing this is so, you know, us as scientists aren't always the ones that are like, here's the information and here's what you should do. And we've done some simulations. This is a tool that we can actually give to managers. We've been doing all this work with Dalarat on the traditional ones on the South Coast. We can give them this tool and say, you know, you have joint, you, you have joint management and you're DPC, you're managing it. What do you want to do? And you can test simulations and it doesn't have to come from us and they can have a look and explore. Um, so the in, we're getting outputs like the impact, the annual impact per trip, and um, the annual impact overall. And um, we can see this is interactive with what annual trips. Fit. This is just recreational boat-based fishing trips. Um, are like before we do the simulation, and then what they're like after we do the simulation. So for now, when I clicked on the polygons, that's we've not done that part yet. Right now, we're just using a shapefile, but we can just see how change trips will change in response to these gray areas, which are the no-take zones. So we can see that this one, we're going to get an extra 175 trips to this area. Um, and then we can do the same with a different plot and see what the change will be. So this is what we're working on just now to try and make a really useful management tool that we can give to um, that we can give to managers and traditional ones of joint management so they can actually test management options themselves. Um, and so that's what we've been working on just now, but we do have a lot of sort of unknown question, questions that we're not sure how to tackle yet. One of the main ones being is how do we model multi-use trips? So right now I'm just modeling one activity and I'm modeling the activity we spent longest on, but how do we model that, you know, we went fishing, then we went snorkeling, and then we went surfing on the beach? How do we, how do we analyze multi-use trips for the purposes of making a management tool and using ROMs? Um, the other one is because we now have um, information on shore-based, boat-based, extractive and non-extractive recreation, how do we look at the substitutability between those activities? So if we put a no-take zone in, will someone that's a really keen fisher actually swap and maybe do snorkeling? Because maybe they've done some snorkeling as well. How do we figure out how people will substitute between these activities? Um, and so we've done this for, we got this data for Esperance, Nangaloo, Shark Bay and Marmion. So we're going to be doing that across all of them. So um, Esperance, Nangaloo and Marmion all have marine parks that are being proposed. Nangaloo, the Gulf is going to be in a new marine park. Um, and then we're also thinking, We've done all this data collection. Is there any chance we can use the same model for all of them? Are the drivers of site choice this is going to be the same across these sites or are they going to be different? And is there any way we can do benefit transfer across these sites? Because collecting the social, like, you know, relatively to doing like what work, it's you not know, a lot cheaper and easier to do to collect the social data, but it's still very time consuming and it still takes a lot of time processing and cleaning the data. But if we have enough, do we, do we need to collect more or maybe we can just do some benefit transfer? Um, so that's just kind of a summary of my project and what I've been working on, and I'll now hand over to Charlotte, who is going to bring biology into it. Awesome. So yeah, as Matt was saying at the start, um, we often do a really good job of bringing biology into how we design our marine reserves and how we protect areas. Um, and we don't include that socioeconomic information quite as well. So what I'm trying to do is figure out a really good way to integrate those things so we can effectively bring both of those things together. Um, the way that I'm doing this is by creating a spatial fish population model. Um, and we chose to do this for Ningaloo first because in theory we thought, oh, Ningaloo, really popular, there'd be lots of data, we'll know all about the fish up there, but that is not the case. Um, it's been really difficult, <laughs> there's no data and I've been struggling, but that's okay, it's, uh, it's a process. Um, so my spatial fish population model is specifically for the Spangled Emperor, um, because that is a species that is really commonly caught up in Ningaloo, it is highly sought after. Um, and the model operates at a really fine spatial scale, this is kind of what the model looks like um, in R is all these little hexagons that are kind of between um, five and a couple of kilometers across. Um, it has both biological components and human components. So the biological components are things like natural mortality. The model runs at a monthly time step. So we've broken down the natural mortality into monthly stages. 
Um, the maturity of the fish follows an asymptotic curve, so the fish mature as they go through the years in the model, and that affects their reproductive output. And then um, we've included some parameters for where recruits go and how that process operates. We don't know a whole heap about the recruitment in Ningaloo, how it works with the current um, environmental influences, but we do know that the recruits like to settle in the lagoons. So um, that process is included in the model. Um, we also realised that fish movement is really important. Um, there's been quite a few studies that show how the patterns of movement in the fish relative to the size of the sanctuary zones where they're placed affects potentially how they protect those fish. So we wanted to include this in our model as well. And um, we've decided on an attractiveness for each habitat type um, with sort of reef being more attractive than a deep pelagic area. Um, and that affects how the fish move through the um, simulated space. And so they are more likely to move to a cell that has a high percentage of reef than they are to move to a cell with a high percentage of pelagic habitat. It's also based on distance between the cells and how far the fish can swim. Again, this has sort of been estimated because we don't really know, but um, realistically, it's unlikely that a fish is going to swim from the bottom of Ningaloo into the Gulf in like two days. So we try to eliminate that from the model. In terms of the human component and specifically fishing, um, we've collected, or I say we've collected, I've taken um, very thankfully some effort data from Smallwood and Ryan who used um, all of their phone diary survey data that goes back to 2011, um, specifically for Ningaloo, and they have um, done some work splitting it up into the two marine parks, the State and the Commonwealth Marine Park. Um, and then we used, um, we went out and did boat ramp surveys, as Nicole mentioned, um, and we've used sort of the proportions of trips that left from each of those boat ramps to estimate sort of um, the effort that is coming from the different boat ramps in the area. We then hindcast this data all the way back to 1960, um, and we use some historical information to kind of get a feel for what that data might look like. We've also got fishing mortality in there because that's the big thing. When fishes go, they take the fish out of the water. Um, so we've used an asymptotic selectivity curve. So those really small fish don't really get selected or taken out of the water. Then obviously as they grow, it increases quite rapidly until they're almost completely selected by the fishery. We've also incorporated the fact that retention changes over time. Um, since they first started regulating fishing up here in like the 1920s, um, the size limit on um, Spangled Emperor has changed quite significantly. At one point, it was like 201.75 centimetres because they still used inches. Um, and now it's all the way up to 410. So obviously that affects which fish are taken out of the population. We've also incorporated change in catchability because as um, technology increases, recreational fishers are getting better at catching fish. They have sounders, they have better rods, they have better lines. And we tried to capture that in the model. And finally, post-release mortality. Um, spangled emperor are a demersal species, so there is going to be some level of post-release mortality when you pick them up from the deep um, and all of those sort of barotrauma and that kind of thing happens. So with that in the model as well. So I have my fish population model with all my little fishies swimming around in Ningaloo. Um, and then we have rums, the ones that Nicole are making for Ningaloo, and we've got our fishes leaving from the different boat ramps where they're going. And they, um, the sites they choose layers nicely on top of the sites that the fish are living in. So we can go, okay, if this boat, if this fisher leaves from this boat ramp and goes to one of those sites that's being pointed to, they fish in that site, there's, there's fish in my model in that site, so then they take those fish out of the model. And the idea is to try and really capture the interactions between the fishes and the fish populations. So if we have lots of fishes going to one specific site, the population will be depleted in that site and then that's going to influence the overall population, but also how the fish move. And then obviously the fishes change their behavior in response to the probability of catching a fish. So they, they then move and then you can see how it's this big sort of cycle where everything is um, integrated. We then want to take it a step further and we want to look at management and we have a whole heap of questions um, that we want to answer. But obviously putting together a biological model and a rum at the same time allows us to take a lot of um, outputs and a lot of information out of the model. So in terms of the rum, we can look at the changes to fish's utility, um, displacement on a really fine scale. So do they just shift maybe a couple kilometers to the other side of the edge of a sanctuary zone and changes in catch? And then also changes in population size, population structure, and also changes in biomass. And hopefully this will come out of one model. In terms of the questions that we really want to ask and really want to um, dig into with this model, 
We've got some biological questions. How would changes in life history of fish affect um, utility displacement and then also our fish population parameters? So changes to reproduction, changes to recruitment, and also changes in movement. How would um, putting a different pattern of movement affect how much people can catch, but also what the effect of management might have? And then for fishing, it's all of those sort of classic things that we think of. Um, what would happen if we put a different arrangement of sanctuary zones in, if we represented habitats differently, if we clustered them all together, and then your classic fisheries management, what would happen if there's temporal closures um, or other fine scale fisheries regulations. But the most important part about this model is that it's on a really fine scale. So we can look really specifically at how the fishes move and then also how those fish are moving and interacting with that. Um, these are some of the outputs. Uh, you don't have to look too closely at what's going on. The model is not working fully, so don't trust any of these plots. But this is kind of an idea of what you get out of it. So this is just total population over time around four different simulations with temporal closures and no take zones. And you can see how the population trends differently. Uh, we can also break it down into different smaller parts of the population. So we've got recruits, sub-legal size fish, legal size fish, and then your really big old, old fish. Um, and you can see how those track individually of each other over time. And then finally, a nice spatial plot. Um, this is the population. You can see there are some areas where there's lots of fish and some areas where there aren't very many. And you can see how that changes over time. Um, I haven't actually linked it to the rums yet. That is um, a near future Charlotte problem, uh, trying to figure that out. So um, hopefully we'll be able to get some of those similar outputs with the rums to complement our fish population. Awesome. So I will hand you back to Matt to finish it all off. Cool. Thank you, Charlotte. Uh, we're going to be pretty quick here. So just in terms of next steps, so these guys each have their own little next steps for the bits they're looking at. But kind of a big picture when I'm thinking about this is that we're working on a couple of aspects of this problem. So we're trying to improve the conceptualization of what reserve benefits are and the language around that. Um, trying to create these workflows, a so workflow for how we measure the welfare impacts on recreation, um, how do we incorporate biology into those welfare impacts, things like that. What I haven't ticked off is the workflow for how to measure the non-use values, which are obviously going to be a big challenge. Uh, the workflow for impacts on commercial fisheries, not something we won't necessarily tackle, but not, not necessarily that challenging. And then the final thing is to convince everyone else that this is good. <laughs> which is its own set of challenges and we're working on that. So I have a small little tick <laughs> for us there. Um, yeah, and I think that is it. Yes, that is it. So do you have any questions? <laughs> ben, if you want to address this too. Um, uh, just, just a general panel. Yeah. Sure. Um, rather than utility models, I, I like I like surfing on one day and I like the diversity of going fishing the next day, but I don't want to go fishing two days on a run. I want to go back fishing and <laughs> go back to surfing. Yeah. yeah. So how, how do you deal with the fact that people actually like diversity? Uh, you could have like a, like a lay thing, like a what you did yesterday variable maybe. I mean, again, this is part of the next challenge and even representing those multiple activities is challenging enough and then representing them within a single trip is super challenging and not something that it's like a mess for yet but then you've gone one step further than that so you so, might just have to deal with that okay bit. so that's that's like, <laughs> I've just got one more question you take you know you take them in, in Dari, you're looking at a system there that's highly degraded um does it need more draconian policies in the short term to get it back to, you know, to, to head it back towards being a sustainable ecosystem um, and then change, you know, changing policies through time because that's always the, the traditional thing in, in fisheries bioeconomics you know if you're out of equilibrium you need to do something much more draconian in the short term to kick the system back to equilibrium yeah so, so there's these really strict closures which to me, seem like good a good policy because the system's highly degraded at the moment. So you're talking about the closure of demersal fishing? Yeah. The other day? yeah. Yeah, I mean, I think, and, and particularly just given the government structure in WA, there's the split between fisheries management 
and marine park management. And I think it's good to kind of separate those two things because it adds a layer of complexity too. But yes, I think some of the fisheries that's clearly showing signs of being degraded and fisheries management things like temporal closures are obviously going to be part of the solution there. I think the marine reserves are another layer, but maybe for a broader ecosystem thing and maybe for that more insurance things. Like that's an identified problem as a solution, get the boats out of the water, right? And it doesn't necessarily matter where they are so much. The marine reserves is more like a general insurance thing for the impacts on the ecosystem. It would have been nice if they were there earlier because those ecosystem impacts might not have been so great. Okay. So we talked about benefits transfer, or the, the, the desire uh, for benefits transfer. Um, and you also talked about, you know, talked about how fine of scale uh, the models that, that you're looking at are, are fantastic. Um, what do you see as being the, the obstacles? And this is as much for people hmm. broke as it is for you, Matt. Um, what do you see as being the, the obstacles uh, for developing the benefits transfer uh, in, in the models that, that you're working on? Do you want to have a crack at that, Nicole? Yeah, I can try. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, I guess, so like on the south coast, it's like there's a lot of um, on the south coast, there's obviously hundreds and hundreds of islands, and then Marmion. I started modeling Marmion, and there's no islands. So I have my I have the same model, for example. So the environments are very different. I'm unsure at this point. I haven't finished my run for Marmion, but I'm waiting to see if I can use the same model to do the same thing. Um, my my main concern is just that the ecosystems and the geography is going to be so different. Maybe I can't use the same model. Um, in terms of how people fish, I, unless there's something very specific, so unless there's maybe like, um, like in Shark Bay, there's like a nursery population or something where there's something different about the ecology of the fish, but I reckon most people go fishing for the same, with the same, for the same reasons. You know, people like to stay close to the boat ramp. People don't want to waste that much money on fuel. People want somewhere sheltered, especially if people are going out for day recreational fishing with their family, they're going to want to go somewhere safe and close. And I think that's probably pretty standard. Um, yeah, I think unless there's some particularly, something particularly different about the geography or the ecology of the system, or if it's, or the avidity of the fishers, if they're really, really keen fishers and they ignore the travel costs and they're like, we're going out. I talked to someone in Esperance who was like, we went to the continental shelf today. <laughs> and so I was like, that's good commitment. <laughs> but not, that's not, not everyone does that though. So I think it's going to depend on how avid those fishers are as well. And that's part of my question is, is differences in fishing culture yeah. for different areas. Yeah. Um, and how that may Yeah. Is that good advice? Yeah, it's <laughs> yeah. I, I think that, that is kind of being, and then we have to ask the question that can be made like, Maybe the nature of fishing culture has a, on the south coast, it's all around, you know, the wind is a really bad thing. You have to fish around that more than in other places. And maybe that's true for the fishing culture as well. And the way to fish. So it'd be interesting. Oh, I can like paraphrase. Okay. Um, those five uh, goals or whatever you call them at the first. The yeah. first one was obviously the, the, the difficult one, um, but I was thinking it might be a, an intermediate question that you want to ask, which is uh, what is at risk? And quantifying actually what is at risk. Now, how do you want to quantify it? I don't know because you can have a biological, you can probably different uh, metrics that we're using, um, right? So that's the first thing I would do um, go halfway. Yeah. Uh, this, the other thing was number five about uh, marine reserves uh, having potential value for fishermen. I think it reminds me of a, of a paper that you probably know very well by Quentin Grafton not a long time ago, where he said, when you take into account the um, exogenous shocks of big variations, then in that case, the marine reserve can be a, um, a re, um, where the species can recover. Mm. And so basically, the Stochasticity of the environment is going to be an important factor in the value of the. So if it's very stable, mm. probably much less. But if it's very now that is interesting because climate change with variations coming much higher, um, that potentially means that the value of, of uh, marine reserves is going to go up uh, for 
the fishing activity. Fish can I? Can and a third on that one. Was that? Oh, no, okay. Yeah. yeah. Um, uh, just a third point was the interactions between humans and and the uh, ecology of the fish. I was wondering how far you would like to go. I think it's meant for for decision makers, so it's more like on the inside. But I suppose that this could be taken by other people and saying, well, once you have a certain, let's say, management regime, what is the dynamics of the system? Is it going towards a stationary um, sort of fixed point? Or is it going to a limit cycle? Or is it going to go into chaotic uh, in a technical sense? And these have different properties that you some you may want or not want. And I'm just that's probably going very far, you probably won't go that far. But what I'm hinting at is that other people can actually, well, scientists, probably mathematicians, uh, mathematical biologists will probably take that and try to understand with that kind of management uh, what happens to the dynamics of the system. And when taking into account all these variables uh, that are dynamic, you know, um, mortality and so on and so on. Yeah, yeah. Um, so on the first one, which was the identifying the what's under threat, mm. was the comment on uh, underwriting each of those objectives. Yeah, and I have thought about it that way, and I guess the challenge is for that insure, okay, and David's challenging my insurance label. <laughs> I'll read that later. Um, but the, the difficulty is, it's like, well, we don't know what, what's under threat, like, because it's the unknown unknowns. So I, I, I'll think more about it, but maybe, maybe I can incorporate something about that. But it is kind of challenging when you don't know the nature of your impacts or what's being impacted. But there's supposed to be some reason why that specific, specific area is of concern, why you're actually interested in that area rather than some other area. So there must be something there that either to you or someone they say, OK, there's something there that is at risk. Yeah. So what is at risk? Otherwise, you'd be looking somewhere else. I think the, like the biologist plan is to look everywhere. Right? And, and like everywhere has, you know, there's a 30 by 30 goal, where 30% of all marine environments are in marine reserves by 2030. And the point being that you don't know the nature of the impacts or their spatial distribution or anything. I just assume you were completely ignorant about everything. What would you do? You'd probably just set some areas aside. Anyway, I'll do that. Number no, no, two. Yeah, it was just the, uh, the idea with the uh, reference to printing graph. Yeah, so that's Works. interesting. I have read that paper, and like, I mean, like, I think it, it is interesting the stochasticity and how maybe under stochastic environments, fishery benefits can be greater. He did assume that any of the exogenous drops didn't have any impact inside the reserve, mm. which is a fairly mm. limiting assumption and not necessarily true, and definitely not been the case here. So, you know, heat waves have impacted populations in reserves and outside reserves, but maybe less so inside reserves. Are you sure they made that assumption? Pretty sure. Okay. Um, I'm just sure. And then number three. Yeah, yeah, and I, and I think people have actually started it because what easier to do this in conceptual space than in real sense. So people have actually been like, okay, how does this system evolve using mathematical models in kind of a conceptual, there's just grid cells and they're interacting and there's reserves. I think those dynamics are known. I think where it becomes, like once you start to get familiar with a particular case study, you realize like, Everything's being driven by a current or like this exogenous thing that's coming in that isn't captured in those conceptual models right. necessarily. Mm -hmm. um, so it's a forced model from the outside. Isn't well, it? well, often, like, you know, like things that drive recruitment are often like, you know, the nature of the current that year or like things like that. And so it's like each case study seems to be quite different and it really argues for this kind of applied local kind of approach. Is how I tend to think about it. But um, yeah, again, maybe you can create a model of everything and have all those things incorporated in some way that have not yet. Um, what is 1154? Should I? Um, I think we can do one or two questions. I don't see people. Do you see anyone? I mean, on the outside. 
No. <laughs> so we have SIF, yeah. Okay, shall I read data? I like maths breakdown for reasons for reserves into categories. The word insurance, insurance companies will only cover risk for which they have some handle on the probability and consequences. They certainly won't cover you for unknown unknowns. I'm not sure that's necessary. Maybe you cannot call it insurance, but maybe it's worth thinking about alternatives. Yeah, I have had a little bit of issue with them. Term insurance. Um, it's been used in some papers. I think we can kind of refer to it in that kind of frame for the fishery benefits thing. Um, but yes, maybe it's worth trying to think of it. What they got it in terms of precautionary principle. Yeah, precautionary principle. Yeah. 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 Okay, well, everyone, any other questions? Uh, just a comment, like, um, it's it's very good. I think they need work of what you have done the five um, cases, the, the scientific discovery thing. Probably is, you know, a, a very strong element in, in them. And also all the uh, RAM and the simulation stuff. Um, I think on Lingo we tried to do something similar years ago. Um, so at the, at the end of the day, you you won't have customers for this work, right? So how do, how do you make this appealing uh, to someone? To so how how do you have uh, how do you set up things? So you can simulate things, but are you talking to them or do you do you have to simulate? some uh, uh, important cases like that 30% thing uh, and then show, you know, do something drastic like something big and then uh, show that this can be used for something. How, yeah. how do you choose your policies? Yeah. Uh, so yeah. on all of these, so the South Coast stuff and the Mami stuff, we are working with DVCA and like the ROM simulations there are tools that we'll be giving to them. <coughs> They've been involved in the big data collection. So we kind of like there's value that but we can take on the community survey because we knew that would be useful, but they didn't quite appreciate at that point why it would be useful. But now we've got this tool. Um, and we'll be working so we've been talking to the TOs about main utility modeling as well. And it's something that, you know, because they're in joint management, they have a lot of um, influence over the process, they want to understand the impacts on recreational fishing, their future managers of that space. So it's a tool that we can give to them to help them identify trade-offs with areas that they'd like to see protected versus you know their impacts on recreational fishing and things like that. So yeah we're trying to feed it into the decision making process. I mean and Abby and I have talked at things about the challenges in convincing people that Welfare impacts are a good idea. We had a debate last week with Ben and the whole in our master's unit about you know if it's fit for purpose and what it means. Um, so yeah, it's an ongoing effort to try and make it relevant. But um, people just they, they love the maps, obviously, and the use maps, easy to interpret, etc. I think there's just more work to be done in convincing them to be talking about costs and benefits. And even just improving the language, I think, is a good, good step. Because the magnitude of the costs and benefits are often, I think, wildly different to what people think they are. So I think, yeah, we, we, I don't know, we're like chugging along. We're just trying to get <laughs> Yeah. But, yeah. yeah. The, marine, uh, the results seem to be small in comparison to the ones you show. And you wonder whether they really have impact, much impact in terms of the cost, cost to keep the fishing. And what, on top of the five you mentioned, is it possible that recreational fishers are from benefit as well? I think I'm not learning fishery benefit, and it is possible. They're probably one of those end cases where it's yeah. really hard to manage fishing effort in recreational fisheries. There's potentially an argument for managing it with marine reserves um, because you know it's hard, it's such a Distributed, hard to monitor compliance and things like that. Um, but yeah, I, I think it's probably another corner solution where reserves a major part of the answer there. Yeah, I'm paying for benefits. Cool. Okay, thank you. So, thank you very good presentation. Thank you. Thank you.